Hello, I'm Maria Ressa. On today's Talk Thursday, we speak to Government Peace Panel Chair Marvik Leonen on the recently signed framework agreement between the government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. Marvik, it's good to have you here. Thanks for having me. Maria. What is, why is this agreement different? Well, this agreement, uh, basically, I think more than the other agreements, puts in a process that could most likely bring in the final political settlement between the government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And when I say a process, it is very close. In fact, it is similar to a constitutional process that allows for a democratic, inclusive, and people-driven uh, driven, uh, uh, process under in different fo uh, forums at different levels. So you have a transition commission that mm -hmm. will draft the basic law for the Bangsa Moro. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes through Congress, mm -hmm. it goes to the president, and then later on would be ratified. The other thing that makes this different is that there is a recognition of the historical oppression of uh, the Moro. And uh, this is by the name itself of the region. It's called Bangsamoro. Bangsa and the definition of the identity of the Bangsamoro without necessarily infringing upon the very basic concept that we have only one citizenship, and that is being Filipino. It looks like you learned lessons from the 15 years of the dialogues. Um, uh, what were the major pitfalls you avoided to come to this agreement? Well, first and foremost is uh, not to risk too much uh, of the flexibility that is allowed in the Constitution. And uh, the second is to uh, accept that uh, there are certain parts of the cause of the uh, Moro Isl Islamic Liberation Front that needs to be formally recognized by government, even though it may have only some social or cultural or even historical significance. And I think the third one would be that uh, we did what uh, was not done in the past, and that is to consult. And this is um, in the MOA AD of the 2008, AD, yes. right, which was de declared unconstitutional. Yes. Go ahead. To make uh, some parts transparent as we go along. That's why we had the decision points of principle of April 2012. In terms of consultation, the government panel, I think, has done about 126 consultations. Wow. The Moro Islamic Liberation Front, on the other hand, has gone beyond its uh, normal circles and uh, that they have actually consulted with the business sector, diplomatic community, uh, scholars, the academe, and so on and so forth. And finally, when we uh, crafted this agreement, the government side decided that even before the signing of the agreement, that we publish it and take, take on all questions, uh, respond to all comments uh, relating to this, uh, to this draft. After all, part of, this, uh, part of the importance of a framework agreement is that it causes or triggers a national debate Correct. on how it would be best uh, to restructure our government so that the aspirations of a culture or a group that has been shunted aside by our historical past could be better addressed. Marvik, in about a year and a half, you did what I thought was not possible, which is to actually reframe the dialogue, reframe the way both the government and the MILF is talking about this. Um, in terms of, of moving forward, though, what's the what are the chances that this then will become a reality? Well, uh, we remain optimistic and uh, probably it's difficult to, uh, to give probabilities at this point. But uh, certainly, if you look at the entire process, government and MILF and the public are going to be very involved. For instance, in the app appointment of the Transition Commission, that there will be uh, nominees uh, selected and named by the Moro Islamic Liberation Front mm -hmm. and also selected and named by the GPH. Already we have signals that it will not solely be MILF that will be sitting in their component, but rather that they are going to try to form alliances with other groups uh, that uh, sort of reflects the alliances, of coal alliances or coalitions that they make with other uh, influential sectors within the area. Well, right now, the MNLF, which had a peace agreement in 1996, um, there's, Nur Maswari has already said he's unhappy with this. Um, you know, how, how will the MILF, how will the government deal with the MNLF? Uh, with the MN, I think, yes, uh, Nur Miswari is saying his piece. But on the other hand, Muslim in Sema has given his full support. Yes. Other leaders of the MNLF have given their full support. In fact, I think a few of them are going to attend the signing ceremonies on, uh, on Monday. Monday. As a matter of fact, I also know that the Organization of Islamic States, uh, the Secretary General's office itself, will be represented as observers or as uh, witnesses or will bear witness to the signing of the document. So there is some convergence. The MILF is talking to the MNLF 
or at least a, a lot of groups within the MNLF, the government has spoken or is in conversation with the MNLF through the formal table and also through very informal channels. And I think that we will see that in the Transition Commission, it will not solely be actors from the MILF or government officials that will be involved. This is a very emotional issue. Um, the, the word Bangsamoro has never been mentioned in a government document before. For whatever reason, the Philippine government stayed away from recognizing the identity of this. Um, you mentioned that when the, president, when the president talked about it, gave the announcement on Sunday, how did, um, how did Murad? The, uh, and and uh, Iqbal, the MILF, how did the MILF react to this? Um, the only thing I saw was, of course, the panel. Uh, yes. the, the, I would say that the speech of the president had such emotive force that it moved them. And in fact, during the closing remarks or the closing statement of uh, uh, my counterpart, uh, Mohaghir Iqbal, he said that uh, they were really emotionally touched by the speech of the president. Uh, that, uh, of course, that they, they now see that the government, uh, through its representatives and in a framework agreement, recognizes uh, the history of their forebearers. Mm -hmm. and You're talking about roughly name. 400 years. Yes. Of the, of, it, it used to be 5% of the population of the Philippines, but the, the Moros considered themselves the, the people who were in this land, in this part of the country, yes. first. Yes, and probably uh, for the public, uh, the Bangsamoro is really uh, original inhabitant and descendants of the original inhabitants of that particular area. The label itself, Bangsamoro, evolved uh, through the years. First Moro, then in, uh, during the time of the MNLF, uh, they endured the concept or created the concept Bangsa, Space Moro, and now the MILF introduces the one word term, which is that of Bangsa Moro. So I think it evolved it, from Nation of Moro to... Um, literally, Nation of Moros to Bangsa Moro, which uh, has a meaning by itself which uh, refers to both the region as well as the identity. But the identity is not the citizenship. It is simply a cultural, social, historical recognition that there are such peoples within our territories. How will this immediately change the lives of the Muslims in this area? Um, I think that there, is, uh, there are pecuniary effects to hope that as soon as we signed the framework agreement, in fact, as soon as we announced it, that there were many international organizations, aid agencies, official development assistance, foreign governments, that immediately announced their support to the Philippine government and to the, uh, the Philippine government, at uh, the very least, to be able to push through with its own programs. I think the statement of hope can still some of the guns act actually in place right now, and uh, perhaps the goodwill, with the goodwill, they will give way to infrastructure projects, social services, and so on and so forth. Um, and therefore, uh, perhaps if we capture this goodwill and actually deliver on some of these promises, then we would probably at least be on our way to strengthening the next stages of the negotiations in this, uh, uh, in this forum. Critical to all of this, though, is security in that area. How would you assess the security now? Will the military and the police be able to handle this? The security arrangements have not changed. Okay. And even with the framework agreement, the, uh, the army, for now, stays where they are. The mm -hmm. police stays, stay where they are. And the MILF, even if they committed a graduated, uh, uh, graduated decommissioning, mm -hmm. will st still stay where they are. The ceasefire mechanisms will still be there. And therefore, the responsibility of keeping peace and order is now with the, still with the government. But this time, the MILF has committed to assist uh, in whatever way that the PNP or the AFP would want them to assist, they would assist in helping uh, keep uh, peace and order. In the past, that when the MNLF signed the agreement in 1996, the MILF splintered, so you had a smaller group to deal with. Now we have a much smaller group, the BIFF or the BIFM, already threatening, splintered off. Um, what's to stop the, the extremists from coming together and what effect can they have on this process? A splinter group can only survive if it has community support and that community support depends upon whether the people in the community have hope in the, uh, uh, the programs of government and in this case have hope with respect to the agreement between the MILF and government. So for one, uh, clearly the BIFF or the so-called Bangsamoro Islamic Freedom Fighters do not have community support. They have been dislodged 
from their uh, from their camps by the 6th Infantry Division and the leaders now have warrants of arrest that are outstanding against them and soon enough our law enforcement uh, agencies the police supported by the military and supported also by the Moro Islamic Liberation Front uh, uh, would now uh, be in a position to actually conduct arrests of these individuals the best way to deal with the splinter group is of course at the end of the day using our coercive force but prior to that is a uh, an understanding or an acceptability of the peace agreements that have been signed prior to it. Um, it's interesting also that Amiril Um Rakata, who heads the BIFF, was the guy, was one of the leaders who sheltered Jema Islamiyah, the, the group that had links to Al-Qaeda. What do you do with the foreigners, with members of extremist groups, of Al-Qaeda link groups that are still in the southern Philippines? Two of them, one is a Malaysian, Marwan and Wawiya, Targets of a smart bomb attack in February, they fled to an area near where Umrakato is. What happens to them? I guess with the goodwill that's created by framework agreement and the necessity to show some measures to build confidence on both ends, that uh, we will see uh, more cooperation uh, from the MILF and their communities. The MILF will run after them? Um, no, it may be a joint action. It may be the police themselves or only the police and the army by themselves. Or perhaps even the MILF would point to certain areas that uh, can be operated upon in order to be able to uh, get them. You see, now the MILF has a stake in good governance in the area. And I do not think that it is in their greater interest uh, to be perceived as an area that is still unstable, that uh, is a breeding ground, that nurtures all of these lawless elements. Um, I've heard it many times from their leaders. These uh, people, these lawless elements, are also their big problem, and yes. that they therefore are looking for ways and means to be able to assist all the law enforcement agencies to be able to correct this uh, phenomenon. Um, uh, a question from S at S.J. Borgetta, and you kind of answered it, but how do we deal with the rogues who disagree with specific terms that have been agreed upon by both parties? Again, uh, it's a political acceptability of the framework agreement that uh, removes the community support. Uh, removing the community support makes it more likely that coercive and law enforcement action will be able to get them. There is uh, no uh, perfect peace process in this, in this planet. There will always be people who would uh, have a difference in opinion. And therefore, dealing properly with the rogues, uh, the splinter groups, would better communicate the idea that the better way to resolve differences is not through guns, but through uh, the media of politics or the media of deliberation, or perhaps uh, going out publicly, criticizing, using cyberspace, <laughs> and using whatever is necessary. Now that the TRO is in place. Yes. <laughs> um, what about, uh, some people are saying this is really just an agreement to agree. Um, there's a lot of dangers still ahead, pitfalls that will happen. What are those dangers and how can you avoid them? The dangers, of course, is if the politics turn the other way, which is that uh, there is lack of understanding of why there is such a need for having a Bangsamoro in the area. But that's precisely why this agreement is also going to succeed. It is because there will be a national debate and there's going to be a national discussion as to why this is so. And we are hoping that everybody will weigh in with their opinions. And weighing in, in with their opinions, um, the, the underlying fears can be examined. Mm -hmm. And the underlying questions can also be exposed, such as, for instance, the stereotypes and the prejudices and the bias that we have inherited from our colonial masters. So again, uh, allowing a free play of uh, discussion in the public would then allow uh, the permanence of the solutions that are there and will correct uh, the potential obstacles, which is that the politics may not be right or that people may not actually deliver on their promises. Um, what happens to the guns? I mean, it seems like there, there are two additional problems. One is that the, both the army and the police, law enforcement is weak in these areas. Uh, are they up to the challenge then? And then what about the men with guns beyond the, beyond the MILF? What happens to the guns? And who's going to enforce law and order? I think the breakthrough with this agreement are several things in terms of the uh, security uh, requirements, number one. There is recognition on both ends that there needs to be a reduction and control of the proliferation of weapons, and that's in the agreement. Second, that there is necessity that non-state uh, security forces, such as the MILF, mm -hmm. must eventually decommission, but in a graduated manner. I would say that perhaps their decommissioning processes will have milestones that are targeted or uh, timed with the delivery of political promises also made by the government. Mm 